الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We have been studying باب في المجاهدة the chapter of مجاهدة of struggling in the way of Allah سبحانه وتعالى So now we move on to the first hadith of the chapter which is the 95th hadith of the book بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فالأول عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله تعالى قال من عاد لي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب وما تقرب إلي عبدي بشيء أحب إلي مما افترضت عليه وما يزال عبدي يتقرب إلي بالنوافل حتى أحبه فإذا أحببته كنت سمعه الذي يس كنت سمعه الذي يسمع به وبصره الذي يبصر به ويده التي يبطش بها ورجله التي يمشي بها فإن سألني أعطيته ولا إن استعاذني لا أعيذنه رواه البخاري وذنته أعلمته بأني محارب له this hadith is narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه he says the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Whomsoever offends a friend of mine, then I announce war on him. My servant does not draw nearer to me than a thing more beloved to me than that which I have stipulated unto him. And my servant continues to draw nearer to me with the voluntary worship until I love him and when I love him I am his hearing with which he hears his sight with which he sees his hand with which he grasps his feet or his foot with which he walks and when he asks me I give him and when he seeks protection in me most certainly I will protect him Imam Bukhari narrates this hadith I announce unto him means I announce that I am at war against him. So this is a famous hadith, uh, Hadith Qudsi, Hadith Qudsi, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is narrating the hadith from Allah subhanahu wa taala, and Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "This is a very famous hadith. It's mentioned in the Arba'in as well. I think it's Hadith 38 in the Arba'in of Imam Nawawi as well." So in this hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is announcing war, harb, against who? Man aada li waliyan. Whomsoever offends a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces war against such a person. So, uh, who is a wali? A wali we translate sometimes as saint and more commonly a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waliyullah or awliyaullah the friend of Allah or the friends of Allah that's how we translate wali uh, but what is a friend of Allah? so you'll find different um, commentaries saying different things but the most common commentary you'll find is a wali is every righteous mu'min every righteous believer is a wali every righteous believer is a wali every Muslim or Muslima who fulfill the obligations, who stay away from the prohibitions of Allah is a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you have, um, if you uh, delve into the books of Tasawwuf, into the books of Sufism, you'll find that there are ranks of the awliya and uh, there are different descriptions of awliya. So for example, Junaid al-Baghdadi radiallahu ta'ala anhu describes the wali saying that the wali is the one who fulfills all of Allah's commands, stays away from all of Allah's prohibitions, does not break any of Allah's laws, is always aware of the boundaries and upholds the etiquettes as well. So a wali is not just a person who uh, fulfills the commands and stays away from the prohibitions, the wali will even fulfill the recommended acts 
and stay away from the minorly disliked acts as well. But the more broader definition is every believing man or woman who is who fulfills Allah's commands and stays away from Allah's prohibition. Mufti Ahmad Yar Khan Naimi Rahmatullah Ta'ala lay comments on this hadith. In um, this hadith also mentioned Mishkat. So Mufti Ahmad Yar Khan Naimi comments on this and he says that in the hadith literature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was available to him after surveying all the hadith literature which was available to him he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only has announced war on two people so from serving all the hadith that were available to him he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces war only on two people number one the one who offends the wali of Allah and number two the one who does not pay the zakat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces war on these two people. The one who offends and disrespects the awliya, the buzurgan e deen, and the one who misses the zakat without a valid reason. Of course, highlighting the importance of zakat as well. But since that's not our topic, I'm not going to discuss that much. From this hadith, we also realize that we should have utmost um, reverence and respect for the awliya we should have utmost respect for the awliya if it was not for the awliya if it was not for the buzurgan e deen the pious predecessors rahimahumullah ta'ala uh, many of us would not even be muslims for example in bangladesh one of the most uh, well known uh, uh, walis one of the most well known saintly figures is who shah jalal rahmatullah ta'ala alayh and if it was not for him, then how many people would not have accepted Islam? So likewise, if you look into the uh, uh, subcontinent, into India, into Pakistan, the amount of awliya who came into those countries, those regions, they are the reason why Islam has spread in those areas. So we have utmost respect, love and reverence for them, and we do not disrespect them in any way. Why the one who disrespects the awliya is calling on to calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is announcing war on such people. Would you want this? So we do not disrespect the awliya, we respect the awliya. Awliya, even Muslims, a normal Muslim, without a valid reason, we shouldn't be disrespecting our normal Muslim brothers and sisters. For all you know, they may be awliya. They are righteous practicing Muslims who fulfill Allah's commands, who stay away from Allah's prohibitions. Why would you offend them? Why would you disrespect them? There was one say man, he was, um, he was majzub, he was a man of uh, states, of ahwal, and he was walking once in the street, and he stepped into, uh, in a puddle, and by the puddle there was a man speaking to a woman. And when this uh, uh, majzub stepped into the puddle, the splashes went on to the woman. So then this man got angry and he slapped the majzub. Then the majzub left, he didn't say anything to him, he left. The majzub comes back the same path shortly later and the people were gathered around. People were gathered around, something had happened. So when the majzub comes closer, what has happened is that this very same man who slapped him is lying in the street, dead. What happened was he was standing on the roof, he slipped and he fell to the ground and he died. And when the majzub came, the people said that you must have um, cursed him and Allah done this to him after you cursed him. And the majzub said, but I did not curse, curse him. The majzub said, I did not curse him. But I'll tell you what happened. I unintentionally disrespected his friend, so he became angry and he slapped me. But what he done was that he disrespected the friend of Allah. And then the one who Allah is his friend, Allah then dealt with this man. That's why we are people of adab, we are people of respect. 
We show respect to people, especially if they are people of religious uh, affiliation. We ask them for their supplications. How many hadith have we crossed uh, which teach us? And in the, in the points of commentary we mentioned, you should take your children to the righteous people. You should ask the righteous people for their supplications. You should show your children how to have love, respect and honor for people of the deen. But in addition to that, we should be wary of disrespecting the people, uh, uh, disrespecting the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Shaykh al Hadith wa Tafsir, Allama Abdul Mustafa Azami, has a book called Aja'ib al Quran, Ma'agharaib al Quran, or Ma'agharaib al Quran. It's been translated into English as The Marvels of the Quran. And in there, he mentions a story and it's, a long, it's not a long story, but in the end of the story, he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on the earth creatures who will attack those who disrespect the awliya. So we are people of adab, we are people of respect. When it comes to the elders, when it comes to those who are alive in front of us, we have respect. And even the awliya who have left this dunya, we have respect for them. We have respect for them. Um, some of them are major awliya and you wouldn't even dare to disrespect them and see uh, what happens after you disrespect them. So, for example, Sultanul Awliya, Muhyiddin Sayyiduna Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani alayhi rahma. People have been known who disrespect him and then on the spot they are destroyed. On the spot they become mad. A story is written about people who disrespect uh, Sayyiduna Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani and what happens to them. And that's very famous. Um, but I think 40, 50 years ago in Pakistan, there's a very famous um, individual who stood on the mimbar and he, and he started insulting Sayyidina Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. And it mentioned that when he died, when he died, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dis, uh, disfigured his face. And on his coffin, they had to seal the, 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 you know, the part where you can move and you can see the face. They had to seal it because nobody was allowed to see his face. And that's what happens, those who disrespect the awliya, um, the, this, the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests even at the times of their death. And you can see. Ba adab, ba nasib, be adab, be nasib. Uh, people of respect are of good fortune, and people of disrespect are of misfortune. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to honor, respect the awliya and to follow their messages and to implement their um, uh, lives into our lives. Ameen. Bijahil Nabil Ameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After speaking about the awliya, the hadith Qudsi continues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant does not draw nearer to me with a thing more beloved to me than maftaratu alayh, that which I have made fard upon him. The most beloved thing that you can do to draw closer to Allah is fulfill your faraid. That's the best thing you can do. Everybody wants to know what is the best thing that I can do to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you the best thing that you can do to draw closer to Allah is do that which Allah commanded you to do. That which is an obligation. That's the best thing you can do. Once you are in a routine of fulfilling your fara'id, fulfilling your obligations, what does the hadith say? My servant continues to draw nearer to me, bin nawafil, with voluntary worship. So with the obligation, you are drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you want to increase in your uh, closeness to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, spiritual closeness, what do you do? Start increasing in your voluntary worship. Start increasing in your voluntary worship. So from this part of the hadith we see, number one, you have a priority in your ibadat. In your worship, you have a priority. You fulfill your obligations. And as you're fulfilling your obligations, you're in a routine, now you can add voluntary worship. Not the other way around. That you're not fulfilling your obligations, but you're doing voluntary worship. Zakat is fard upon you, you're not paying zakat, but you're giving charity. You're giving sadaqah, but zakat is fard upon you. You're not praying your salah, 
But when the special nights come, you start praying nawafil in the special nights. In the blessed nights of Ramadan, enter. If you have qada, you should be making up your qada. If you're not making up your qada, then reading nafal is mawkuf, it's stipulated, it's not going to uh, rise into the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you are praying your faraid, your obligations, then of course you can pray your nafal. If you're praying your obligations and you're making up your missed prayers and you have time, you can pray your nafal. There's nothing wrong with that. But how good would it be to spend that time making up the obligations? And any time that you get to make up your missed prayers, how amazing would it be to not have any missed prayers? How amazing would it be to have no missed prayers, no missed fasts? You're up to date with everything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be in this state. For uh, however long we live, may we be in a state where we have no um, outstanding prayers and you have made up our obligations. The hadith does not say, it doesn't specifically say salah, that the most beloved thing that my servant can do to do nearer to me is pray the fard salah. And then my servant continues to draw nearer to me with voluntary salah. It doesn't say that. It just says obligation. And then it says voluntary prayer. Which shows us that this is much more generic. It's not restricted to salah. This is generic. So this we can apply this to fasting for example. The most beloved thing that we can do to draw closer to Allah is fast. The obligatory fasts. But then what can we do on top of that? Do voluntary fasts. Pay your zakat. But if you want to draw closer then you can give voluntary charity, give sadaqat nafila. This servant will fulfill the obligations and then go beyond the obligations and start praying and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala voluntarily. Hatta uhibbahu. The servant will draw nearer and nearer to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, until uhibbahu, I love him. Each and every single one of us wants to be in this in this group of people who Allah says, I love him. Who wouldn't want to be there in that place where Allah says, I love him? Now we know how to get there. Fulfill your obligations and then be in a routine of fulfilling your obligations. And now start with voluntary worship. Whether that's voluntary uh, salah, voluntary sadaqat, voluntary uh, fasting. Then what will happen? You will enter, inshallah, you will enter the realm of the ahibba those who are the beloveds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ When I love him. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you signs. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a person, what does that mean? When I love him, I am his hearing with which he hears, his sight with which he sees, his hand with which he holds or grasps, his foot with which he walks. What does that mean? First and foremost, we all know that this cannot be translated literally. This cannot be translated literally. Na'udhu billah, that would be impermissible. Um, so what does it mean then? Of course, we're not translating it literally, but um, so what does it mean? Abu Uthman al-Hiri rahimahullah ta'ala was asked uh, he's from the, um, the the past predecessor he was asked what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says I am his hearing with which he hears he says this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill his requirements before he even takes benefit from his hearing so when you hear something the speed of the hearing, quicker than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill your need. So you will not even have a need to raise your hands. 
Because before you even raise your hands, Allah will fulfill your need. Other commentaries mention what this means is that the hands, the, uh, the hearing, the eyes, the hands, the feet will now abstain from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the person such strength that they will not listen to the disobedience of Allah. They will not look at the disobedience of Allah. Meaning they will not disobey Allah with their, he- with their hearing, with their sight, with their hands and with their feet. That's a common commentary you'll find on this hadith. But Ghazali Zama, Razi Dora, Allama Sayyid Ahmad Kazmi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala in his book Tawheed or Shirk, he speaks about this hadith and he says that this doesn't make sense. Because you have to abstain from looking at haram to enter this, this stage. You have to abstain from listening to haram, from doing haram to enter this state. So if you abstain from all of that haram and enter this state, how can this mean that you're going to abstain from haram? So this means something else. He says, and there's another commentary you'll find, uh, which is a very um, uh, famous commentary, that I will. I am his eyes. I am his hearing, with which he with, with which he hears means that such a person's hearing will no longer be restricted by distance and sound. Such a person, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, will allow them to hear from near and to hear from far. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will allow them to hear from near and from far, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will allow them to hear that which has sound and that which does not have sound, even thoughts. I will, I am his sight with which he sees would mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will strengthen this person's sight so much that he or she will be able to see from close and from far. He will be able to see that which has a physical presence and that which is abstract things such as emotions I am his hand with which he holds would mean that this person's control would not be restricted to that which just which the hand can touch but his control will be vast by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I am his feet with which he walks means that the steps this person takes are not restricted by this dunya. Close and far become same for such a person. This hadith is in fact uh, a proof for karamatul awliya, a proof for the miracles of the awliya. According to the Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, karamatul awliya ithabitatun, the miracles of the godly people, the miracles of the Friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thabitatun, are established by Quran and Hadith. I'll give you some examples of karamatul awliya, where they have entered this realm, they have entered this rank, where they are now the beloveds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where they are now the beloveds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One example is in the Noble Quran, Surah An-Naml, verse 38, 39, and 40. In the story of Sayyiduna Sulaiman alayhi salam. There's mention in the noble Quran. Sulaiman alayhi salam invited Bilqis to come so that he could invite her to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bilqis left with her army to come to Sayyidina Sulaiman in Palestine. Bilqis had a throne. Had a throne. And the, the, the description of the throne is mentioned. This was a huge throne which would take tens of men to lift the throne. It was very heavy. And the distance between Bilqis, Bilqis's palace and Sayyidina Sulaiman in Palestine was a journey of six months. Was a journey of six months. 
Now the Noble Quran says, قال يا أي يا أيها الملأ أيكم يأتيني بعرشها قبل أن يأتوني مسلمين. سيدنا سليمان عليه السلام says to his people, O oh group. So Sulaiman alayhi salam in the morning would have a majlis, would have a seating where he would sit and the people would come to him, the humans and the jinn would come to him with their problems and he would fulfill their problems, he would give them solutions um, and he would have his main advisors with him. So now it's the majlis, Sulaiman alayhi salam asks the people, O oh people, who from amongst you can bring her throne here before she comes here submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So she has left. It takes six months for her to get here. Who can get her throne, go there, get her throne and bring it back before she comes? قال عفريت من الجن أنا آتيك به قبل أن تقوم من مقامك وإني عليه لقوي أمين. Then a jinn said, ifrit, a type of jinn from the jinn kind said, I can bring it to you before you stand from your place, and I am able, well and able to do this, and I am able and trustworthy. I can do this. So the jinn says, your majlis has started now. Before you end your majlis today, I can go there and bring it to you. I can go there, a journey of six months, get the arsh, and I can bring it here. Moments, couple of hours. It's a six months journey, but I can bring it to you in a couple of hours. قال الذي عنده علم من الكتاب. Another person stands up, whose name later we learn is Asif bin Barkhia. The one with whom is knowledge of the book stands and he says I can bring it to you before you blink your eye So then when Suleiman looks what does he see the throne is in front of him and then this man says this is from the grace of my Lord Asif bin Barkhiya, a human being, but of such a high rank, from the awliya. In the Quran we are told, he performed this miracle, that he was able to bring the throne that takes tens of men by his self, within a moment, he was able to distance of six months, within the blink of an eye. This is, Kuntu yadahu lati yabtushu biha, I am his hands with which he takes. There are a number of um, examples of karamatul awliya in the Qur'an and hadith. We can't deny them. It would be incorrect and wrong for us to deny the concept of the miracle, miracles of the awliya. Many are mentioned in Qur'an and hadith. I'll mention just uh, two or three more. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari that uh, uh, three men came to the house of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he gave them some food he gave them some food the narrator narrates the hadith and he says I swear by Allah <coughs> we would not lift a morsel of food except that after it the food would increase so they were eating food he says, every time we would lift a bite, Allah would increase the fruit. He says, by the time we had finished and all three of us were satiated, the food was more than it was before. The food was more than it was before. Sayyidun Abu Bakr as-Siddiq says that he took the food to his wife. And when the wife looked at the food, the wife says, Or he presented to her and said, look at the food, look what's happened. And she says, um, I swear by the coolness of my eyes, this food is three times more than what I gave. 
It is three times more than what I gave. Then Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu <coughs> took the food and gifted it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That food remained with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The daytime came, the matters and affairs of the day um, took place and a time came where a group of, uh, 12 groups of people, 12 groups of people, not 12 people, 12 groups of people came. The Prophet ﷺ gave each group of people the food. One group ate, the second group ate, the third group ate. All 12 groups of people ate from the same food. And when they had finished, the food was still left as it was when they started. This is mentioned Sahih Bukhari. So an example of a miracle that happened at the hands of the follower of the Messenger of Allah, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Another beautiful miracle. In the time of Sayyiduna Umar, this is mentioned in the Layl al of Abu Nu'aym. This is a famous narration as well. In the time of Sayyiduna Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sayyiduna Umar <coughs> sent an army, sent a, uh, an army to go to war. And the head of the army was a man called Sariya. The head of the army was a man called Sariya. So now the army has left. They are fighting the battle wherever they are. Sayyiduna Umar is in Madinatul Munawwara. It is a Friday. Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is standing on the mimbar. He is giving a, the khutbah, the Friday sermon. All of a sudden, Sayyiduna Umar turns to one direction whilst he is standing on the member in Medina. He says, Ya Sariyatul Jabal, Ya Sariyatul Jabal, O Sariya the mountain, O Sariya the mountain. Then he continues with the sermon. Some time later, a messenger came from the army and Sayyiduna Umar asked him about what had happened. And the messenger says, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, we were in the battle and our enemies had overcome us and the enemies had surrounded us. All of a sudden, we hear a voice saying, O oh, Sariya the mountain, O oh, Sariya the mountain. And that's when we turned our backs towards the mountain and we continued to fight and we were victorious. Here we see what the hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, hadith could see. I am his sight with which he sees. Sayyiduna Abu Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is in Madinatul Munawwara and by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is seeing what is happening hundreds of miles away. This is Karamatul Awliya. The next one is it's another famous narration, a very interesting narration mentioned in I um, think Riyadul Nadra. <laughs> Imam Tabarani mentions in uh, Riyadul Nadra. Imam Jaladuddin Suyuti mentions this in Tariq al Khulafa. When Egypt was conquered, the conqueror of Egypt was Sayyiduna Amr ibn al As, ta'ala, and who he is Fatihu Misr, the conqueror of Egypt. When he conquered Egypt, uh, you have the famous uh, Nile, the river Nile in Egypt. The people of Egypt came to Sayyiduna, uh, the, the conqueror, Sayyiduna Amr ibn al As, and they said to him that every year, we sacrifice a beautiful lady and they throw her into the river Nile so that the river Nile uh, flows throughout the year and if they don't sacrifice a lady and throw her into the river Nile then the cities will be destroyed and there will be a famine because the river Nile will not flow so Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As then sent a message to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Then Sayyidina Umar sent a message back to Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Sayyidina Umar says in the letter that Islam has cancelled out all ignorant practices before it. Meaning this practice of sacrificing a beautiful lady in the river Nile is ignorant. We don't do this. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in fact gave Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As a letter and said, take this letter and place it in the river Nile. That letter read, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is a letter 
from the slave of Allah, Umar, the son of Khattab, to the river Nile of Egypt. It's a letter to the river Nile of Egypt. If you flow by your own power, then we have no need for you. But if you flow with the permission of Allah, then flow in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Sayyiduna Umar told Sayyiduna Amr ibn al-As, take this letter and place it into the river. And he took the letter, he placed it into the river, and it's mentioned that that very night, the river Nile had, the river Nile had filled up and it had risen 16 arm lengths high. 16 arm lengths high it had risen and every single year thereafter it increased 6 arms length and it flowed throughout the year. As a miracle of Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So we have many examples in Quran, many examples in Hadith which establish Karamatul Awliya. And the last part of the hadith is And when he asks me, I give him Who? Who asks me? The one who has fulfilled Allah's commands And on top of that is performing voluntary worship When such a person asks me, then I give to him And if he seeks my protection I've mentioned this before, there are three particles of emphasis here most certainly, I will protect him. Most certainly, I will protect him. Who? The one who fulfills Allah's commands and the one who goes beyond with the voluntary worship. Some final points are regarding this hadith. The fulfillment of obligations is given preference over fulfilling voluntary worship than fulfilling voluntary worship. I've heard in the past people making, uh, you know, claims regarding voluntary worship and nawafil and awrad. I even heard somebody saying once that uh, if they miss their awrad, they can't live as opposed to missing their salah. How does this make sense? Your awrad, your wazaif, your wazifas, the incantations you read, it's all voluntary from yourself. But the salah is an obligation. So this order is extremely impo important. How does this relate to the chapter Mujahada, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We strive and our striving has an order. You strive to fulfill Allah's commands. You strive to stay away from Allah's prohibitions. Then you start building on this. Bin Nawafil. You continue to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bin Nawafil. With your, vo your voluntary ibadat, your voluntary worship. There was a story that there was once a man, he went to visit a shaykh, a wali. And he was sitting with the shaykh for some time, he had a conversation, he had some issues. After they had finished, the shaykh said to him, stay behind, stay behind, we're going to have some food. The man knew that in his house his wife was making some chicken. And the shaykh usually eats dal. So he thought, I, I need to go home, I'm going to have some chicken, I'm not going to have lentils. But the shaykh was persistent and said, look, no, stay, stay behind, have some food. And he, he continued to say no. So eventually the shaykh was upset with him and said, okay, go then. Then he left. He went home and as he was hoping, he had, uh, his wife had made a beautiful chicken for him, delicious chicken. So time came to eat, so he sat down and the chicken was in front of him. He's about to eat and a dog comes, bites the chicken, 
takes it outside and throws it in the gutter and runs away. <laughs> so he comes outside, he sees his chickens in the gutter. He's thinking if he wasn't if he wanted to eat the chicken he should have taken it with him at least. <laughs> he just threw it in the gutter. Then he realized what has happened. He has the Shaykh asked him to stay and he kept saying no. So then he went back to the Shaykh and he apologized. He said, Shaykh, I'm very sorry, you were very persistent and I, I didn't listen to you, I should have listened to you. And the Shaykh turns around and says to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, given certain creatures the duty to teach people the respect of the awliya. <laughs> Meaning, I told you to stay behind and you didn't. That's why the scholars of uh, Sham say that if an if a elderly person or a wali gives you something, just take it. Even if you don't need it, just take it from them unless you upset them. And if you upset a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then uh, you never know what's going to happen. Allah knows best. It's just a story that I read and I'm saying it just to lighten the mood because I can see you're half asleep. <laughs> So, the whole point of our discussion is we should try our best to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the points we mentioned in our last dars, you just take the first step. Allah will make everything easy for you. Just at least try. At least try. Take the first step. Look at this next hadith. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الثاني عن أنس رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يرويه عن ربه عز وجل قال إذا إذا تقرب العبد إلي شبرا تقربت إليه ذراعا وإذا تقرب إلي ذراعا تقربت منه باعا وإذا أتاني يمشي أتيته هرولة رواه البخاري This hadith is narrated by Sayyiduna Anas رضي الله تعالى عنه from the Prophet ﷺ in that which he narrates from his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When the servant draws nearer to me a hand span, I draw nearer to him a arm's length. And when the servant draws nearer to me an, an arm's length, I draw nearer to him by six feet. And when he approaches me walking, I approach him running. This hadith is mentioned by Imam Bukhari. I've translated it literally. But what, what is being said in this hadith? Again, it's a hadith Qudsi. Again, it's a hadith Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. The Prophet sallallahu is narrating. What's the hadith? When the servant draws closer to Allah, in the form of ibadat, in the form of worship, one hand span, Allah draws nearer to the servant at arm's length. Of course, we can't translate this literally because distance cannot be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its real meaning. The commentaries say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fast in accepting those deeds. And in another commentary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy rushes to that person as if he's done more good deeds than he or she actually done. And then if a servant goes more than a handspan, does a bit more worship and draws closer to Allah at arm's length, then Allah draws closer to him a ba'an, which is a fathom, six feet. Meaning whatever you do, Allah will pull you closer to him more than what you've done. Whatever you do, Allah will show you more mercy than what you've done. Whoso, وَإِذَا أَتَانِي يَمْشِي And when he approaches me, yamshi, walking, أَتَيْتُهُ harwalatan, I approach him running. I approach him running. Of course, this doesn't mean running. It means you put in some effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then pull you the rest of the path. Take the first step, Allah will help you on the rest of them. Even the first step, Allah is the one who allows you to take it. But at least take the first step. 
at least take the first step to go to the masjid. At least take the first step of actually getting up for Fajr, of actually moving out of your bedroom. At least take the first step of entering into the class of sacred knowledge. You do that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pull you His way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy will envelop you. And we'll finish with the next hadith. The third hadith. An Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ni'matani maghboodun fihima kathirun minan nas, as sihhatu wal faraq, rawahu al Bukhari. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma narrates, he says, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, two blessings many people lose out on. There are two blessings that many people lose out on. As-sihhatu wal-faraq, good health and free time. Good health and free time. <laughs> there are two blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many people make Allah's on. They don't take advantage of these two blessings and they lose out. As-sihha wal faragh Good health and free time. Good health is such a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, there was a statement, As-sihhatu tajun ala ru'usil asihha la yaraha illa du'afa. Good health is a crown on the head, on the heads of the healthy. Only the unhealthy are able to see it. Because you only know the value of good health if you are un unwell. That's when you know the, the value of good health. Ibn Kamal, rahimahullah ta'ala says, that one of the reasons why these two are mentioned specifically, many people will spend their good health in idleness and they will not utilize it in any useful activities. In fact, they will spend their health until they lose their health. Losing health is an inevitable matter. You will, never be, you will never be healthy always. Is there anybody who claims that? Is there anybody who thinks that they will always be healthy? That's the system of this life. That's the nizam of this life. That's how it happens. We will reach a point where our health will only and only deteriorate. We know that. وَمَنْ نُعَمِّرْهُ نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ In Surah Yaseen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ نُعَمِّرْهُ Whosoever we have given life to, نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ We will return them in the creation. Meaning the way that you were born, and you didn't have strength, and you strengthened, you were able to speak, see, hear, walk, and you were strengthened. What's going to happen? Eventually you're going to go back down. You're going to lose the hearing, you're going to lose the sight, you're going to lose the strength, you're going to be unable to speak, and then eventually you're going to be able, you're unable to even uh, rationalize and think properly. So we all know this. So why not use this? Why not use this health? Free time, people spend this in being lazy, people spend this in being negligent. People spend this in sleep until they don't have any more free time. And even when you get free time, what do you do? What happens to that free time? It just passes. A whole day you can work 9 to 5. But if you have a whole day free, when it gets to 5, you're going to think, wait a minute, what did I do today? The whole day, I, if I was at work, I would have spent the whole day working. But today I was free. But how did the day just pass? 
That's what happens, we don't know And we just waste our time Good health And having free time Use this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Use this for your prayers Use this for um, gaining sacred knowledge Spend this time wisely Spend this time wisely Because you will not always be able to Sit in gatherings for long You will not always be able to understand What the teacher is saying So whilst you have time Whilst you have the ability Use this Use your free time Use your good health The poet said اغتنم ركعتين زلفا إلى الله إذا كنت فارغا مستريحا. Take advantage of two cycles of prayer to draw closer to Allah when you are free and able to. وإذا ما هممت بالنطق في الباطل فجعل مكانه تسبيحا. And when you want to speak in idle talk. Then place in its place the glory of Allah, the speeha, the speeha of Allah. فَاغْتِنَامُ السُّكُوتِ أَحْسَنُ مِنْ خَوْدٍ وَإِنْ كُنْتَ بِالْحَدِيثِ فَصِيحَا Taking advantage of silence, meaning being silent, is better for you than delving into idle speech, even if you are very eloquent. أخبرنا خير بني آدم وما على المرسل إلا البلاغ الناس مغبونون في نعمتي صحة أبدانهم والفراغ. The best of the children of Adam informed me, and there is not upon the messenger except to pass the message that people make a loss in two bounties: the good health of their bodies and free time. So whilst we have good health and whilst we have this free time, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do mujahada, strive in His way and draw closer to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.